Okay, well, um, welcome and thank you for joining the first of three UX Design Industry Night panels. Industry Nights offer recent graduates and current students of the User Experience Design Program valuable insights into industry as they start on new and exciting career paths. We also want to welcome members of the broader Emily Carr community who have joined us today as well. This event is hosted by Emily Carr Continuing Studies, and I'm joining this event today from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. I'm grateful to be living, working, and connecting with you from the territories of the Coast Salish peoples, but also through online portals, we may be connecting across many different traditional territories and lands. I encourage you to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which you live and learn, and the importance of connecting back to the land in these digitally mediated times. So today's panel explores a day and a life of a UX designer from the perspective of four established professionals. With responsibilities ranging from research to development and everything in between, the role of a UX designer can change depending on the organization or project, the designer's scope of knowledge and expertise, or working with an internal team or external client. Joining today to share their insights are guests Sean Brower, Sean Deng, Scott Yu Jan, and Tori Shao. Each panelist will introduce themselves and briefly share their journey and relationship to UX roles, both past and present. We then have a series of questions prepared for the panelists that they'll have each a chance to respond to. And then we'll end the session with questions from the audience um, in the last 15 minutes or so. And you can add your questions directly into the chat at any time. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to our first presenter of the evening, Sean Brower. Hey everyone, thanks Christina for that intro and uh, thanks everyone for joining <clears throat> this talk. Um, my name is Sean Brower, as Christina mentioned, and I've been now graduated from university for uh, about five years. Um, I graduated in 2016 from the School of Interactive Arts and Technology at uh, SFU, actually. Um, and kind of throughout my experience, I've been able to do kind of a full gambit of different um, roles uh, in kind of the work experience I did before I graduated, as well as uh, kind of once I was in the industry. So kind of what I would say my typical day <laughs> when I have uh, because now my kind of job title is product designer, but uh, when I first graduated, it was UX designer. Um, and that's kind of something that I'm sure a lot of us will touch on is kind of how this, the role itself and the name uh, kind of changes quite a lot depending on what you're doing. But um, kind of from my perspective, the typical day changed a lot depending on what role I had. Um, working with a lot of big companies uh, as a co-op when I was still in school at university. So, um, I worked at actually BlackBerry back when it was called Research in Motion still. Uh, I worked with uh, SAP here in Vancouver and then also a very small uh, design agency that focused on branding called Dossier Creative, which is also, which is here in Vancouver in uh, Railtown. So kind of depending on those different uh, companies, I was able to try quite a lot of different things and what I was responsible for was quite different depending on the role. So uh, when I was at Research in Motion, I was actually responsible for making animations for um, the new OS system for BlackBerry because uh, they were shipping out a bunch of new phones. I don't know if anyone remembers this, but uh, they actually shipped five new phones when they were trying to make uh, kind of a push back toward Apple and uh, Android, and they had their own OS. Uh, There's a lot of kind of innovative features in there, but um, they were hard to kind of understand for the users at the time. So my actual job was to make animations and different things to kind of teach the OS to people. So that was kind of my first job. So it was a lot of kind of um, motion graphics focused and trying to put my head and uh, put myself into the shoes of a user who's using this new OS for the first time. Um, and then I moved on to working at SAP for uh, 16 months as a co-op, so two back-to-back co-op terms, so it was quite a long time actually, and in that case I was actually doing B2B uh, SaaS uh, software, so this was working with huge multinational brands such as John Deere um, and, uh, and Coca-Cola and these uh, kind of types of businesses who used 
SAP's kind of uh, analytics dashboards to understand how their business was doing across the world. Um, so uh, uh, quite a big change there. And kind of as a designer in that context, it was much more about working with a large team, uh, a very large team, where uh, you would be given kind of briefs from the different product managers as to what it is that uh, the overall business is trying to do with the software and what kind of need they're trying to satisfy for the different clients, uh, whether it's John Deere um, <laughs> or another huge kind of person who's already paid SAP a lot of money up front uh, for the software and now you have to deliver on what they promised. So these kind of business needs come down uh, and they filter down to uh, you as a UX designer and you're trying to figure out how do you satisfy that business need at the same time while having a good experience for uh, the end user in a cohesive kind of manner across the whole um, kind of tech stack of the software as a service. So um, that was kind of what I really focused on <laughs> uh, at SAP. And then kind of when I, uh, I graduated actually after my time at SAP and I worked at a small agency as my first job outside of school where I was a UX specialist working on kind of uh, brands, small websites here in Vancouver. So I worked on the Gastown BIA's website uh, as well as a little work on uh, Boom, which is an art blog actually as well. So um, these are the kind of businesses I worked on after, which was a huge kind of change from the large uh, multinational corporations <laughs> that I worked at previously. Um, but it was interesting to kind of meet people directly and have that kind of client relationship where you knew exactly, or uh, you don't really know who their end user is, but you have a client as well, which makes kind of like a trifecta of people that you have to satisfy, which is kind of the clients, uh, the users that are going to use the client's um, uh, website as well as <clears throat> kind of your own uh, business. So uh, I worked there for about a year as well. And that was quite a lot of a different work where it was kind of doing competitive analysis on different um, websites and how they're dealing with different problems and how they're using their brand to kind of invigorate their business. So it was a lot of different kind of challenges there. Um, so yeah, I think that was, again, getting a lot of different uh, things under my belt was the first thing that uh, I would consider kind of the day to day was a lot different depending on the role. Um, and kind of since then, I have kind of uh, moved into the startup area. Uh, I did work at EA for a brief uh, year as well, but the last three years of my kind of professional career has been working for Copilot AI, which is a startup that started here. And uh, I worked um, as designer number one. <laughs> so my day-to-day -day has been anything but uh, kind of consistent since then. So the last three years have been a whirlwind of uh, being somewhat of a marketer, somewhat of a uh, product manager, as well as the designer that the business kind of needed. Um, and that's really kind of uh, what I would say is like, <laughs> depending on the role that you're in, uh, there's a lot of different things that you'll need to be kind of ready for. And we can kind of get into uh, the specifics of what uh, I had to do at kind of each role and what uh, that kind of looked like. But that's kind of the introduction to me and the typical <laughs> day in the life across the different roles that I've had before. Yeah. Thanks so much, Sean. Lots to lots to unpack there. So um, I was busy taking some notes for follow up later. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, we'll move on to Sean Deng next. Yeah, thank you, Christina, and thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. So I'm Sean, and yeah, another Sean, <laughs> and uh, I'm currently based in Vancouver, and uh, I'm a UX designer working for Microsoft SharePoint Spaces which is a uh, mixed reality tool for enterprise use cases. And uh, yeah, I'm not like really experienced in UX design. I would say I graduated. So I, I'm actually one of the COVID cohort members where I graduated last year. So there was no convocation or of any sort. Uh, I graduated from a school called the Center for Digital Media here in Vancouver. So it's uh, the degree that that master's degree is a co-accredited by four universities and Emily Carr is obviously one of them. And the campus sits right next to the Emily Carr campus, which is also super nice. It gives me the convenience to uh, talk to, to learn from, and to work with some Emily Carr students as well. And uh, so, yeah, I because I'm also a recent grad and I didn't really have much design experience beforehand, I, I would say my story started as a designer really uh, was when I came to Vancouver in 2017. Uh, 
in September 2017 for this master's program, or I was preparing for it to say the least. And later on, I joined this program and I finished this program, then I transitioned into design. Like the, my first ever full-time design job was actually at SAP as well. And the same team Sean was at, so SAP Analytics Cloud. So I was designing for that for 12, not 12 months, like 11 months uh, until I left for Accenture or Avanade, which is, the, uh, which is a consultancy, of course. And after that, because of the relationship between Accenture and Microsoft Business Group, I moved on to uh, Microsoft as a UX designer till now. And so, yeah, I, I, and I was a business student back then. So I, I'm here just to say, you don't have to worry about not having um, a design background of any sort. I think the whole design industry or the job market has been like a rat race. The reason why I'm seeing it is it puts a lot of pressure on people who don't really have experience. But for those entry jobs out there, when they ask for experience and it's still an entry level job, how are you supposed to be ready for that? I, I think it, they're just giving, um, or setting a lot of problems for people who are really interested in this design world. And I, and I think everyone deserves a fair chance. And that's why I'm here advocating, or at, at least to say, uh, helping uh, people from different backgrounds to, to get into the industry. Um, however, I can be of help. Um, yeah, I, I, anything else for my background? So yeah, SAP Sean was covering that as well. It's B2B. Most of my journey actually um, were business related. So that actually has something to do with my business background and being a consultant at Avana. Also, I was working for TD. Uh, TD was my only client for uh, eight months. So that was a very interesting experience working as an as a as a vendor and not really inside their design team, but also had the chance to uh, collaborate collaborate with them, giving me a different perspective of what designers can do both in, internally and externally. And now I'm I'm getting back to this uh, product design world, uh, where it's also very uh, I guess it's a new topic too, uh, because Microsoft just launched Microsoft Mesh early this year, and we're ever in the virtual world, and we are having this uh, discussion over Zoom, and it's all virtual. So our team is building virtual events in Microsoft Teams. So it's a new concept with this metaverse kind of thing that Facebook just released. Uh, so I think a lot of opportunities are ahead of us. So it's hard to say which kinds of or which types of designers this industry is looking for because this industry itself is ever changing and it may require different skills or experiences because I don't really have an MR design experience back in school. I only did a VR project uh, during my graduate life, but that's not, I, I guess to a lot of people that probably wouldn't be enough uh, to prove that I have tons of experiences working for MR, but yeah, I'm, I'm still here working for that product so everything is possible. I'm just here to be a positive note. Uh, I think that will be my intro. During my, yeah, one, one more thing about my day to day. It, I'm a very boring person. I guess I'm just, uh, I will dedicate probably four hours of my day just to do has some design work because I really don't want to uh, focus on something else like reading emails or getting back to Teams messages because being in a huge organization, it, it's the part that you can work with different people, but it's also, something very consuming, especially time and effort consuming where you have to take care of other things. So I urge myself to do more uh, during the daytime and I can take care of other things uh, when it's not really my focus time. So yeah, every day just supporting our engineers, doing all software development work and uh, being an advocate in the design community as well, trying to help more people. Yeah, that, that would be my intro. And again, thank you for having me here. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, we're gonna move on to Scott next. Take it away, Scott. All right, so I'll actually be sharing my screen really quick. So just give me a big thumbs up when you can see uh, the slide full screen. Everything good? All right, we're still here. All right, cool. Um, in the initial email, it said that I am a product designer at um, Amazon Care. That's no longer the case. I actually just left and I'm now an interaction designer at Google. Um, so hello, I'm Scott Yujan. 
And the reason I have a deck, even though this is a casual chat, is because I actually just recently had to give this presentation for the team I joined at Google about my background and stuff. So I figured I'll just give you guys the same spiel. Um, so it all kind of started nine years ago when I wanted to be a painter. I really wanted to be a painter. That's me graduating high school. Very optimistic to be a famous painter. And uh, didn't really work out. Uh, I came to Emily Carr <laughs> to study painting. And that was when the logo looked like this. Uh, during that time, I got a job as a woodworker and I kind of fell in love with just making stuff. Um, and that's, you know, not long after I switched into industrial design and throughout the industrial design program, um, one of the things I started to notice was that no matter what I was making, furniture, toys, whatever, I was always very interested in how people interact with these objects. And um, that was when I met this professor, Hey Garman, who was like, yeah, that's called interaction design, man. And I was like, what even is that? I didn't even know what it was at the time. And so after doing research, I decided to major in industrial design and interaction design. Now, um, that's the school stuff. Getting into the career uh, stuff, I mostly started um, in the summer. I had the summer job at IRL Creative. They are a prop house in Vancouver, and they make props and design stuff for uh, the film studios. And that was a lot of fun, getting to like make stuff, work on it for hours and hours and days, and see it in the hands of like famous people. <laughs> um, I also worked on a few shows here and there, uh, lots of DC superhero stuff. And the process is the same, you know, a lot of prototyping, testing, uh, testing it with stunt actors, training them how to use a prop, and then seeing it in the show. It was pretty fun. Um, now, during school, uh, outside of the summer job, I did whatever work I could for the uh, Emily Carr Research Labs. Uh, I worked with Health Design Lab, Living Labs, PMP Lab, uh, did everything from marketing to lots of wearable medical devices at the time. I'm not sure why. There's a lot of startups doing that. And um, one of the companies I worked with through Living Labs was this uh, part-time job with ANK Robotics. Um, they were a company startup working on making autonomous robots for floor cleaning. It's a bit hard to explain, but... Uh, there, I learned kind of a very important thing about this field. Uh, the thing I love most about this field and being a UX designer is the fact that um, most of the time, you actually kind of get to work on projects you get in whatever way you want to work on them. This means, you know, their skills or processes you really enjoy or want to learn or just even try. Uh, most of the time, you can and should bring those into your projects. So, for example, um, I was hired for NK Robotics to be an interaction designer to work on the UI of the robot. But as someone who came from an industrial design background, I've always wanted to work on the product holistically. I've always wanted to do the design for the hardware and software. So I just asked them, hey, can I do it? And yes, I ended up designing everything from the concept uh, development of the device to designing for manufacturing, prototyping, and working with super talented mechanical engineers to actually build the first version of this robot. And um, another example is, I also really wanted to learn motion design and animation. So once again, I just convinced the client, hey, let's bring motion and animations into the user interface. And after a bunch of YouTube tutorials, that's exactly what we did. We brought a bunch of animations into this thing um, to convey different statuses of the robot. And yeah, this was kind of the first big project that ended up landing me a job at Amazon. So um, cool thing about Amazon, it's the same thing. Uh, I didn't expect it, but it's not just a small company. So uh, we were... Um, making this experience to let customers give delivery drivers feedback and compliments after a delivery. And after a few brainstorming sessions, we wanted to, you know, we decided to take it in a fun direction. And at the time we were going to commission illustrations and animations from external agencies. But once again, I just said, Hey, can I take a crack at it? And uh, they got me in touch with the right mentors and experts in the company. And uh, I ended up getting to create the animations that um, ended up in the app. Um, and that was super fun. It's quite satisfying to really like be in the place where you get to learn new skills while on the job and build fun things and launch it for, you know, a bunch of users um, and actually see them tweet about it, which was both very scary, but also kind of fun. Um, I don't want to mislead you guys, though. Of course, I skipped a lot of stuff in there. Uh, there's obviously a lot of, you know, traditional UX processes, sketching, paper prototyping, critiques, research and testing, all the regular stuff. But um, my point is kind of like the design process is very flexible. So if you don't lose sight of the things you're trying to learn or just the parts of the process you actually enjoy, then you will be able to most of the time get to do those things in your projects. Um, it's pretty awesome. It's one of the best things about this field. So anyways, after working for Amazon, uh, I joined this, I mean, amazon.com. I went to this other team called Amazon Care where I worked on kind of a secretive 
internal healthcare service for Amazon employees where I got to do some service design. I can't talk much about this project, but after a while I left and joined Google where I'm working on other things I can't talk too much about. But um, yeah, so that's it. Um, thank you for listening to my spiel and thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Scott. Now I'm very curious. I'm sure everybody is very curious about all the things that you can't tell us about, but um, we'll let that go for now. <laughs> and then last but not least, we have Tori. Um, hi, everyone. This is Tori here. Um, you must be curious why a software engineer joined this panel. Um, the reason why is because I recently made a transition from UX to software engineering, especially the front end. So I'm currently working at this company called Collection, uh, and we work on uh, Web3 in NFTs, uh, especially focused on the K-pop, J-culture, and uh, the anime manga space. So pretty cool. Um, so uh, this is where I'm at. But let me tell you basically like uh, the story, how I got here. So I started from and just like a regular uh, university engineering student. My goal was to go through civil engineering and then go to the master and then do like architecture. That was my initial goal. But during the mobile, um, what is called the mobile age, when it was exploded, when the, the iPhone came out and I figured, oh shoot, this, this thing's cool. I need to get involved. So uh, I got to explore like you know, HTML, CSS, web development, mobile app and all that. And I decided this is where I want to go. And I started to do a lot of Google search, like where can I like study, where can I learn about mobile apps, mobile designs and all that. And Emily Carr back then was the only school in BC that offers a inter interaction design program. And that's why I got to, you know, I worked really hard and got into Emily Carr because Emily Carr was not easy to get in, to be honest. Um, and then, yeah, so I went through a four year program at the interaction design. I studied everything and I did a lot of internships and freelance uh, projects. And I want to highlight this because it is very important. Uh, we got an awesome program set up and we got awesome teachers and, and teammates, but there's no way you can get real experience unless you work on real projects. So when you're a student, leverage that. Um, a lot of opportunities are only available for, for students like uh, when you're still at school. So make sure you use that. I think I did at least three internships when I was at Emily Carr, got through like um, through the, well, we have like a job board back then that you can just like got connected to like startup founders and all that. I got to work with a very cool startup back then uh, through the job board. So that was awesome. Um, so I did a lot of that and I graduated uh, um, back in 2016. And I also got my first job at SAP, just like the other two Sean's. So I'm also an SAP alum. Um, but I didn't work in Vancouver. I actually got a job from their uh, Bay Area office. So I moved to the States. I worked in Bay, um, San Francisco Bay Area for two years. Uh, it was awesome because I wanted to go to the capital of technology, which is Silicon Valley. You get to know people from Google, Facebook, Airbnb, Uber, and all, that, all those cool startups. You get to work with really smart and hardworking people. Uh, very fun learning experience. Uh, but after two years, I'm like, um, I want to move on. I want to explore new stuff. And another trend came in, which is the digital nomading stuff. So I started to do digital nomading. I quit my job at SAP. I start to uh, freelance again, and then do a consult, uh, work as a consultant for like startups. And um, at that point, I have like about three years of experience, and I start to you know help startup to build up their UX process how to find good UX designer, how to build a good team and all that type of stuff. So I did that for a while and then COVID happened. So that's why I came back to Vancouver and I got a job settled down again to here and start to learn more about the local tech scene again. Um, at this point, uh, it's been four years since I left Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver changed a lot. So when I was graduating, I remember it was so hard to find, your, find a job. There's literally no tech companies here back then, like when I was in, at school. And now we have Amazon, we have, uh, we have Microsoft, and uh, we have, uh, I think there's a Google team here. I don't know, like, yeah, Scott can probably answer that. We got Shopify, yeah, for sure. And uh, they're all like 100% remote, which is awesome. So the, the Vancouver tech scene really boomed in the five years. That's what I'm trying to say. So for the students, it will be much easier for you guys to go out 
uh, and uh, really work hard to get your first job in the industry and really, you know, just like take off from there. It be, it's much, much easier than when I was at school. So you guys are really lucky. Um, yeah, so at this point in my career, and then I was doing just being a UX designer and I started to get curious on the coding side again. So I was an engineer student, if you remember, I talked about before. I learned Java like 10 years ago or something. And I really feel like um, at this point, I want to explore more about the programming side and I want to be more like a, like a unicorn person. If you know this term, it's like for, pe for people who can both design and do programming. So I started to explore that. I did a lot of self-teaching um, like just teach myself to code using freecodecamp.org. I think that's the website I used. Um, I worked in Bay Area for a while. So I have a lot of friends who were engineers at Google or Facebook, they're very really good engineers. So they taught me like how to fast track this, how to learn coding fast and all that. So I spent a year and then I got my first, uh, current job, which is uh, at the startup. And I work, uh, so for five days a week, I spent two days on UX, three days on front end. So I'm doing more like a hybrid role now, um, but gradually I would transition to like 100% front end. Uh, but in a startup setting, uh, everybody has to wear different hats. So, you know, you see engineers doing, I don't know, product work or you see product managers doing marketing and all that. And I'm currently doing UX and front end and maybe sometimes a little bit of the recruiting stuff because I know a lot of people in the industry and help our team to find the, the best talent. And I really, really enjoy wear multiple hats, uh, working a very small team. So we got connected to each other. And then, yeah, it's just that possibility that gives you that you can imagine how this company will grow in 10 months or like one year, two years, three years. That type of vision gives me a lot of excitement into my day-to-day -day job. So uh, everyone has their own preference. Some people prefer like bigger teams, bigger companies. I figured I'm a small company person and I prefer to work in a startup. And then especially when, now when, um, you know, if you pay attention to all the Web3, NFT, crypto trend, the whole internet industry is going through a new era again, uh, just like 10 years ago when we got into mobile. So I think it's a great, great opportunity for uh, kids nowadays to get involved. So I encourage you to explore and learn more about NFTs, cryptos, Web3. Uh, go to Twitter, go, to, go use Discord, uh, explore all these things. And that is my intro. Thanks so much, Tori. And thank you, everybody, for your introductions. Uh, that was a lot of information. Um, I have a few follow-up questions that have come up that I, I might want to start with before we get into sort of the general Q&A. Um, something that Tori was mentioning, and also uh, Scott, you mentioned it, Sean, you mentioned it, both Sean's mentioned it, everybody mentioned it, um, is the sort of working with both startup or the smaller kind of team environment versus working for the big business um, kind of companies and, and large teams. Um, I'd love to hear from, um, from the others, which is like a preference for you or is there a preference or what kind of stands out for you one versus the other? Um, not necessarily about uh, one being better, but something that you found that you appreciated about one over another. Sean B, do you wanna, if you're, if you're ready, I'm just gonna call on you. Yeah, for sure, oh, I'm ready for sure. Uh, and yeah, I would echo it kind of Tori mentioned as well that I found web three to be like a very interesting area and it needs a lot of UX help in the years to come uh, and it's really cool so I would also recommend yeah check it out uh, discord has been really fun but uh, to answer your question um, for me I definitely have a preference and uh, that's why I've been at <laughs> the startup that I've been at for three years now um, because for me the biggest thing is just being able to see the company grow based on your uh, own individual input. Uh, definitely like at the larger companies, you know, you can go ham and really like, you know, shed tears and blood and whatever over your job. And, you know, the most you'll get is from your manager saying like, you know, good job. And it's somehow like feels a little less uh, direct response to your kind of effort I found than to what you see in a startup. Like when I joined Copilot uh, AI, I was uh, employee number 11, I think, and now we're above 50. So 
every kind of thing I did in that first year was like completely just immediate feedback, like straight back at me. Uh, and it kind of humbled me as well as a designer a little bit too, um, because, you know, you have very little uh, capacity to work with. So you really have to make everything that you do as good as it can be with as little like functionality or like, you know, as little uh, kind of time investment as you can. And I find that kind of uh, constraint management and working within kind of what you have to be, you know, another activation kind of of the problem because uh, you don't have infinite resources and everything. So you're having to like kind of make some hard decisions about what needs to be there and what shouldn't be there. And I think there's a quote about that in design where it's like, you know, uh, your design isn't finished until you're like crying uh, when you're like taking away more and more from the design. <laughs> so uh, yeah, not a direct quote, but definitely for me, that's what I found to be so satisfying. And as well as just when we start hiring more and more people in different parts of the team, um, it's really like satisfying to see people who've like immigrated to Canada and they're able to kind of like hang their hat working at this company that I've helped kind of build. So that's definitely what motivates me the most and why I think I'm going to stay kind of like in the startup area. <laughs> definitely. Uh, unless I get too burnt out <laughs> perhaps, but yeah, that would be what I would say. Great. Thanks, Sean. What about you, Scott? Unmute. Oh, there we go. Um, for me, yeah, I have to, uh, agree with everything that he just said. Uh, the impact is huge that you get to have at a startup. And, you know, I was talking about learning things and just getting your hands on whatever you want to get your hands on. That's so easy to do at a startup. Um, you want to do the marketing? No one else is going to, you do it. <laughs> so it's like literally anything you want to work on, you can work on. So there's definitely a big part of like uh, the, the ability to just learn a bunch of skills in a startup in a very short amount of time. I mean, when I was at NK Robotics, you know, that was just like a four to five month thing and I got to learn you know industrial design at a in a way I never got to do before I got to do motion design I got to do marketing I there's a bunch of other stuff I did for them that I didn't even show that I never would have been able to do at a large company um, in a large company there's definitely like pros as well uh, you know you don't get to wear as many hats as you might want to but um, you get to work with other people though you get to talk to those teams you know uh, being at Amazon it was the first time I got to like see an actual whole branding team and see like 10 people that just works on the branding and it's super cool to get to know about you know their expertise and their areas as well and um you may not get to wear those hats but it's cool that you know you get to collaborate in a very different way which is neat um impact wise i couldn't agree more the impact you do in a big company is definitely like nothing compared to what it feels like in a startup where you're like in the trenches you like you made this thing happen so yeah there's definitely a lot of differences here and there um the pro of the big company though is the the access to the number of users right because like when you do testing all of a sudden you can do testing with thousands of people in one week um and at startups, you get that as well, I guess, in some cases with testing, but, you know, it's the resources and stuff like that, I think is very different. But uh, I wouldn't say I, I lean towards one or the other. I, I think they both have a lot of pros and cons, and it's important to know those pros and cons. So when you're in those places, you kind of take advantage of it. Um, but yeah, that's all I got about that question. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. What about you, Sean D? Uh, yeah, I... I I, I would say that my case is a little bit different because to me, it's, it's a perfect balance because I work for a team that works like a startup, but it's in a huge organization. And I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the culture every day. And uh, I love the support from my teammates and I'm learning tons of things every day. And I'm also doing things that are supposed to be outside of my job like descriptions. So for example, I'm building a virtual office store for our Microsoft Vancouver office and uh, using our own product, which is more or less a product marketing work. And I'm just doing that because there's no dedicated product marketing specialist for our particular product because we just launched it uh, probably three or four years ago. So it's fairly new uh, compared to the whole Microsoft uh, landscape. And also, being in a huge organization gives me the opportunity to learn from people. I really enjoy the work established by other great designers. And uh, like, for example, when I was doing something uh, that's going to be launched, I'm not going to get into the details, but I was working on something that's relevant to Outlook, that's relevant to Microsoft Teams. I could always grab a designer who worked on a particular feature or belong to that uh, actual team to ask them what was the logic behind their design. So it's not just what, what's surfacing uh, on the website that I'm seeing on a daily basis, but also their thought process 
uh, the, the whole efforts from their design team. So it's basically having those conversations really teach me a lot. Like that, that's definitely something I, I didn't imagine uh, getting from the industry or getting from my day-to-day -day job because I was, I was dreaming or I'm not dreaming. I was imagining myself doing the hands-on design work and someone would, or for example, like a design manager would just tell me like, oh, Sean, do this or do that, like finish this, finish that. But in the, in the, in the real life, it's uh, sort of different. I can drive my own design directions and I can still have my support uh, from other folks who are more experienced and I can do something that I love on the side. So it, to me, it's, a, it's sort of a perfect balance. Uh, and so I don't really have a preference, but what I do notice uh, for me is that I care a lot about the product I'm building. So it's not that if you ask me to design something that I'm not really buying as a customer myself, then I don't see the value inside of it. I, I, I just cannot say, oh, I'm a designer designing something that I personally don't like. And unless I have a way to change that and change it for the better, then probably I'm not gonna do it. So it, it doesn't matter whether that's big or small because big companies still have small products or new products versus small, like even startups, not even like uh, uh, scope wise, not even small or big, but startups may have also uh, impactful solutions to the world and they're saving lives and where they're doing great things. And if I'm interested in that solution, then I'm on board. So it's more or less my passion and I care more about the product I'm designing for. Uh, so yeah, I also, I guess people who I work with um, because I, I care a lot about if I can get personal learnings from them, that will be great at odds. It's, it's not just me doing the design myself. It's also a bunch of other people, whether that's engineers or other designers who have more experience than I do, then those are all great contacts, great people to learn from and work with. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Just thought I would throw that in there while it was fresh in everybody's mind. Um, but I do have some questions that um, I sent to you earlier uh, that I'm going to uh, ask you now. So we'll just go, whoever would like to answer the question first, if you want to raise your hand and let me know. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, thinking about your, like the early stages of your UX career. Um, can you share an example of a project or responsibility that you were assigned that was completely unexpected um, and that you had to kind of learn on the fly or you just had to take it on and see what you could do with it? Can I actually start first? I, it reminds yes, me of please. at SAP because I told you guys I, or told you folks to be more inclusive. I, I, I was a business student, so I didn't know anything about making animations, drawing things. I, I cannot draw. So it's embarrassing. Uh, but when I was asked to do like uh, illustrations and also animations for SAP Analytics Cloud, and that's the mobile app. And if you guys, if you folks search on the App Store, Apple App Store, then you could find my profile picture on that screenshot. And that was a credit for me because I did or I refined a lot of those onboarding animations later on. And I had to deal with the, the timelines on after and after effects. And I had to learn that from scratch. I never used that software. <laughs> and I had to do that because of my work and I'm not using it anymore. But I'm not saying it's a useless skill, but it, it was eye-opening because I spent my time learning how to do things. and. Uh, and getting the pressure from my peers too, because I, I, I know at the time that they did it before me and I was just making things better and making new animations, making some illustrations and adding them back to the animation, some, some kind of work. So I struggled a lot as someone who didn't use Illustrator, didn't draw on the digital artboard. I use Sketch to, to, to make illustrations. I'm not sure if anyone would uh, how, how would you translate that into your workflow? But I use Sketch to do those illustrations, not in Adobe Illustrator, which was frustrating because Illustrator is meant for that purpose. And I just didn't know how to use it. I still don't know how to use it. 
Uh, but rest assured, I finished my task. I, I made it work. Uh, and it's 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 online. It, it's ready now. So yeah, definitely a great experience for me to learn. And after that, I asked my design lead why she would ask me to do something that I'm completely not comfortable with or not experienced on. And she's told me that because she knew, she knew that was something that would make me uncomfortable and she would just throw, throw me under the bus just, just to get me out there and try to do things that's different, that's outside my comfort zone. I think that helped me a lot because I know now I'm still experiencing some, uh, some VR things that I'm totally not sure about. I, my whole mind was wired in a way that I can only think 2D, <laughs> like on this flat screen. And now you're asking me to design something like a game because VR is all everywhere. It's, it's pro probably some interactions happening behind you. It's uh, above you. So I'm still struggling, uh, safe to say that, but I, I mentally feel less stressed because I know uh, with the proper learning and I, my, my team would always be there to support me. So I can always ask questions if I don't feel right to do something. So yeah, great learning experience. <laughs> do something you're not sure about and uh, you learn a ton from those things. Oh, I was just going to say really quick. So that's awesome, Sean. Um, we actually skipped Tori on that first question. Uh, just heads up. <laughs> Oh, that was only because Tori talked about it quite a bit um, oh, in terms gotcha. of enjoying okay. and really enjoying and moving into that startup space. But sorry, yes, Tori, if you okay. wanted, just to wanted to make sure anything, she didn't have anything. Yes. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Thanks for being on top of that, <laughs> Scott. I yeah, yeah, I was like, was that intentional? I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll, I'll go. Pay attention. Yeah. yeah. Oh, actually, Sean had his hand up. I'll let Sean go. Sean, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was going to mention the, the thing that I had to learn kind of on the fly was uh, after I worked at the agency I worked for, I got a year contract at uh, EA Games and I got to work on their FIFA mobile game. Uh, so that was really cool to work with such a big brand, but uh, it was a really hard kind of like change in terms of like how I thought about design because mobile games inhibit or uh, they kind of take up the space that, you know, they're not a very good representation of like the best that UX design and like has to offer. They're like very complicated in order to feel as if you as a player are kind of going down this rabbit hole and getting better. Uh, they have to make it like increasingly complex. Um, and I was actually responsible for kind of not just designing screens, but like designing systems that could basically expand in infinite directions, like as much as the producers wanted them to do. So it became kind of this crazy thought of, you know, it, I think it definitely happens with a lot of UX designers where it's like, okay, we need you to make onboarding. And then you make like 10 screens and they're like the most manicured, amazing screens. And, you know, everything is put in correctly. And then at the end, you're done the onboarding. And it was a great experience. And you start uh, whatever it is that you're working on or like whatever the app is trying to help you do. But uh, in this case, it was like, how do you make elements that can be plugged in and reused and changed and updated in the art the artists can change the background sometimes and you know just having to work within that completely kind of crazy system uh that needed to be scalable for the producers was definitely something that i did not really understand when i went into it and then by the end of it i kind of had a better understanding of how kind of mobile games work and how uh sometimes you're asked to design just pieces that then can be used by other people if that kind of makes sense. That was the biggest kind of learning I took where it was like, we need these pieces and they need to act like this. We don't know how we're going to use them, but we're going to figure that out later, but design it with like half that knowledge. Uh, and that was definitely like a very hard challenge, but also very cool to see them just kind of run with it when we were done. And they, we actually shipped out. We had a publisher, I think Tencent was the publisher in China. And it was like uh, all of the revenue we made in the entire world and then like the revenue we made in China, it was like China made more money <laughs> than like the rest of the world together. And we had to kind of use these different pieces like in order to kind of ship it out. And they made all sorts of new stuff for the kind of Chinese market with these crazy systems that I had no idea how um, how far these guys could actually push them. <laughs> uh, and it was pretty, yeah, interesting. Yeah. That's awesome. I guess I'll go next. Um, 
Yeah, you guys learned about such cool things. Uh, mine's going to be so boring, but it's an interesting one, I guess. Uh, yeah, I did motion design, which I learned on the job, which was cool, but I wasn't really assigned that. I, I wanted to do that. I came up with an excuse to do it. But I guess one that I was kind of uh, shocked by and surprised by and had to learn really on the fly was uh, Amazon's writing culture. So Amazon has uh, this really bizarre writing culture where at the start of almost every design review or meeting, you go in and it's just silence for the first five to 10 minutes. And it's because everyone's reading a document. Um, the whole idea is that, you know, you can't package things up in a nice presentation you got to just write everything in documents and so you go into a meeting and then it's just like everyone just reads the doc for the first five to ten minutes and then they discuss it's a very efficient way of doing things but i'm a terrible writer i'm dyslexic too so uh, i didn't enter the design field to write but that was one thing i had to kind of spend a long time to uh, get good at and it's very like helpful though. Like now um, I have a really good habit of like writing good documentation for my designs, which at big companies, it's very helpful for, uh, you know, everyone's knowledge sharing and just writing good documentation for design for future designers, for business people to be able to see what's happening and all that. So yeah, it's, it's a very nice and useful skill that I picked up, but it took me a long time to get used to that. I, I would go into meetings with presentations ready and they'd be like, where's the doc? <laughs> and that was pretty painful for a long time. And yeah. But I really like that now, though. And now I actually can't go into a Google review without a doc because now it's just become a very big part of my habit. It's very efficient. So, yeah. Tori, you have the floor. Sorry, I was a mute. Um, so, yeah, I work at a startup right now. So I can probably talk a lot about it. But I guess for more like an entry level folks like you know students to decide whether to choose to join a startup or a big company if you got an option my quick answer will be um if you're not sure join a big company because in order to work at a startup you know everybody just mentioned like it's intense you need to know what you're doing and you need to learn really, really fast for most people like me included when i first started this career i was like I'm clueless, right? Like, I don't know how things work. Scott just mentioned this uh, meeting notes conversion that Amazon, like every company has their own way of doing that. You need to know how to write emails. You need to know how to communicate to people. You need to know how to um, be in a meeting to actually get a result out of it. Like all these things you need to learn. Um, a lot of the times at startup, there's so many, so many things you need to learn that it's very hard for you to catch up. So, I mean, if you want to learn all these things like outside of UX, and they're actually very, very crucial for your career, um, you need to join a big company to learn it. Like if you're, you, if you get an awesome offer from Google or like Facebook, Amazon, Shopify, you, you get to observe from other people doing it, like the senior designers or like product managers, engineers, you get to learn that. Where at a, at a startup, it's like um, startup can be chaotic. Right. And sometimes there's no process because everyone's pro, everyone's good at what they're doing. There's no way for you to slow down and really take your pace and learn it. Where in bigger companies, they have training, uh, they have like mentorship program. That's what most big companies have, like SAP included. SAP was awesome at training um, new grads. So, yeah, like I would say for a student, if you were just, if you just started out and you're not sure, it's like, I don't know what to do in my career, I just want to learn join a bigger company like that would be your best choice unless you really really know what you're doing so yeah I guess that would be my answer to to that question great thank you everybody mm -hmm. um so it, this is a somewhat of a follow-up question but um also kind of spins out a little bit from it so you've each been working in industry for a few years um, but with technology and processes and strategies and job titles constantly changing, there's always more that you can learn, more you can discover. Um, so how much time do you spend upskilling or attending lectures or networking with other people or researching and like sort of figuring out where you want to be in the future of UX? I can, I go. can go first. Uh, oh, yeah. Go go ahead, no, you, I cut you off last time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I guess I go. Um, I personally don't. 
I personally don't spend a lot of time learning. I'm going to be honest. Uh, I don't do a lot of proactive learning. I kind of just learn things as they come. Honestly, I, I go to a lot of conferences. Those are super fun and engaging and you get to meet really cool designers and listen to talks by very talented designers in the field. And uh, those can help a lot, honestly. Um, tech constantly changes, um, but I don't think it's anything to be afraid of. I think uh, what barely changes is people, sadly people always stay the same and we're designing for people. So if you have a good process and you get to know the people and you know how to work with them and know how to design for them, then I don't think you have that much to worry about. I think learning about what's coming is fun, but you got to, at the end of the day, it's all about the people you're working with and, you know, always super focused on how do you design better for people in general? That's my answer. <laughs> I mean, my, my answer was going to be similar to that too, where if it's a not it's, if it's outside of work, there's very little that I do to kind of like go into the tech uh, landscape and try and understand. I think in general, I'm a, I would call myself a bit of a futurist where I'm always kind of interested in the new tech that's coming out and what's going on and like what is, how is Facebook positioning itself to be like a metaverse owner and this kind of stuff. Uh, that kind of, you know, will pop up in my feed and I'll read about it because I'm actually just kind of genuinely interested in it. But uh, in terms of, um, you know, reading kind of like business books or like best in class UX uh, books, it has to be pretty top shelf and like well recommended for me to kind of like spend the time on it. Uh, otherwise, I'll kind of lean on, again, the organization I'm a part of um, to kind of like give me that uh, kind of career development uh, budget and time to work on that because, you know, we're all humans, we all have to kind of you know, we're not our work at the end of the day, we should still have hobbies that are not like, oh, I can't wait to look at, get off my screen and then look at my screen some more, you know? Um, so I think, yeah, it's just wait for the things that you're genuinely interested in to pop out at you and really dive into them. And I think that's kind of been my, most of my learning has come from uh, looking at Web3 and that kind of stuff as kind of what was talking about. It's just super interesting to me. It's new tech. It's very kind of like, whoa, what can we do with this? Like, how does this solve UX problems that we've had in the past? And is there anything new that's going to come out of this? Uh, and that's kind of what really has driven my interest in like learning more in terms of new uh, things. And I mean, the same thing happened with VR as well, <laughs> where I got really into VR for probably like a year. And then I kind of was like, okay, I'm going to wait for this to kind of you know, develop and become more of a kind of integral part of tech stack. Um, but it was really cool to kind of see what people are doing. And every time I put on a VR headset and it's improved, it's kind of cool to watch that. Um, but yeah, I think it's really cool to see interaction designers who were 2D, kind of go back to Sean's point, where you can only think of 2D, but then all of a sudden it's like your body is the screen and like you have to use your whole body to do stuff. It's kind of interesting. And are there design kind of um, I almost found that it was almost easier for people to pick up VR than it probably was the first desktop computer because it's just kind of like use your hands and the buttons and stuff. It's just kind of uh, interesting how that works. But yeah, that, my answer is yeah, I don't do a whole lot other than like within work. Uh, Sean, do you or Tim? Tori? Are we going to go next first? <laughs> I'm still thinking. Sure, yeah, no worries. Um, I, I personally have a very unconventional way of learning because like, unlike the other folks, like it's very hard for me to focus. So I don't really read books. You should read books for sure. Students listen, read books. Um, but that doesn't work for me, unfortunately. So my main resource is to like catch up with the industry trend or whatever. It's actually Twitter. Um, most people who work in tech, doesn't matter if product manager, engineer, like uh, designers, everybody's on Twitter, uh, especially the folks in Bay Area, like they're, they're all on Twitter. So I actually got into crypto and Web3 through Twitter and I actually got my first job, like my, my sorry, my current job from Twitter. I got contacted by the CTO of my current company say, hey, do you want to work with us, blah, blah, blah. And I got in contact and went through the process and I, I was hired. So what I'm trying to say is if you want to know like uh, the most updated stuff, because sometimes there's a new framework came out, there's a new design system, there's a new UI trend, like you don't really know it until like you need to check for, like people are going to start the conversation on Twitter because a lot of designers, like you guys all work at Facebook, Google, Amazon, like you're busy, right? Like 
a lot of designers, like great designers, they don't have time to publish like blog posts or do podcasts. They're just like way too busy for that. So if you want to get in touch with these people, you want to know what they're working on every day, they are all on Twitter. So that's why it's very important. Like you can DM them, like say, hey, like for example, say, hey, Sean, I know you're working on this awesome design system stuff. Can I chat with you for 30 minutes? Like you can just like message people like that and reach out to them if you want to learn something. It's the best place to learn. Uh, that's basically how I learn. Uh, if you want to read more things in depth, like you can go to Udemy and grab a tutorial, go to YouTube, whatever. But for me, I always start from Twitter. Like, hey, this new thing just came up, new design system from Shopify or whatever. Okay, I can reach out to the designer who worked on this and just ask questions. So for me, that's the way I learn. Yeah. And now it's my turn. Thank you, Tori. Uh, <laughs> I was still thinking though, I think for me, Tori's point of unconventional learning was kind of inspiring to me because I was thinking on my own, uh, what are the ways that I use to, to, to push myself outside my comfort zone? So I think through daily conversations with, with folks uh, who I work with, um, I think that would help me to, to, to learn what they are working on. And some of the parts might not be uh, something I personally know or understand. So I would just ask follow-up questions because of those scenarios. And also, I think the mention of social media, social media is actually a very powerful tool. Um, and it can be toxic, <laughs> but it's also very powerful nonetheless. Uh, I think Microsoft does a very great job online because the Microsoft design community is very, very popular online. And designers write uh, Medium posts, uh, writing some Medium, they, they post things regularly, and they do Instagram random posts, even memes online. So they're very good at social media marketing. And I think that's where I learned a lot of new trends about our own company too. Like inside my day-to-day, -day, I, 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 everyday work, I, I, I won't pay attention to, oh, something is launching. So, uh, Days ago, so there's a studio called Microsoft 365 Expression Studio. That's the studio I really love. They made all those uh, UX films uh, for Microsoft 365, Windows 365, or for Microsoft as a whole company. And I really love those animations. Not just disclaimer here, uh, they're not making those things on their own. They still partner with different creative agencies around the globe, but the quality of their work is just mind blowing. And they just launched a new product called Microsoft Loop. That looks pretty much like a Notion, like a rebranded kind of Notion. So if you folks are interested, find it on, on, online. And that's how I got to know this new product in my own company through social media. I didn't, I didn't get any news from my own company. I literally was just browsing on Instagram and I found this post. I was like, oh, what is this? And I, I, I finished watching the video and I was like, oh, this is a new thing. Then I started to realize, okay, a lot of folks were actually working on this new thing until this morning, the Fluent Design System had this share out meeting where designers were presenting this cool idea. Then I could have the chance to know who's behind those uh, designs or products. And if I'm super interested in learning or even using their products, I would just reach out. That, that's one of the perks being a huge org. You, you always have something going on. You might not know that, uh, at the point where something happened, but after all, you, you, can, you can get those to the right channels. And another way is uh, like just watching tech videos. I, I, I kind of think, um, I, I don't want to read books either. I'm just not a reader. So I watch a lot of YouTube videos on tech reviews, things like that. And they just always have the latest and greatest technology. And I'll just learn from that. And if I'm particularly interested in something, like I didn't know our competitor Facebook was doing so much for their uh, Horizon work, their work room product, where you had this uh, VR headset and it captures your hand gestures too. So everything is replicated in this VR world and it's so advanced. I didn't know that. All I knew was a news post that, oh, Facebook launched this or, uh, or even for Microsoft, like HoloLens launched this. And I, I didn't even know what that could be like until I watched some videos or some reviews from other folks um, firsthand. 
then that's that that's how I learned how to use it. I think getting those information from from secondhand experience counts too. And uh, if you are a pro, learning from others, I would definitely also like Tori said, encourage you to reach out to people who are behind those technologies and great designs. That would be very much helpful. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, I'm just noticing the time and it's six o'clock. So I'm, I want to uh, open the chat so that if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask the panelists, please do feel free to type them in there. Uh, in the meantime, if I don't see anything pop up in the next five ish seconds. I do have more questions that I've prepared. Um, so I'm just going to keep going um, until I see something that comes up. So um, something else that I had sort of put into the series of questions to the panelists previously um, is like, what is a workplace skill that you've developed um, that's helped you be more effective in your role or in roles that you've uh, grown into or or transitioned into is there something in particular that really kind of helped push you forward in your career i see a lot of thinking faces oh sean yes think, thank you <laughs> i think for me it's kind of it's kind of boring but it's just like using your calendar effectively um has made me like just so much more effective at being like, okay, I'm thinking about this right now. I'm gonna throw something in my calendar so that I remember it tomorrow. Um, and even just in Slack, like having, uh, I mean, I use Slack at my company, but I'm sure Teams has an equivalent thing or whatever chat tool you're using, but being able to remind yourself of messages, like looking the message and be like, remind me about this tomorrow at 9 a.m. Like I don't have the capacity or the mental, like it's not getting in there at all. So I'm gonna just put it over till tomorrow. And just taking that time to like actually be like, oh, I got to talk to this person. Or even if it's something just super simple as in like, I want to tell them that they did a good job. Like I'll even put a task like that in my calendar and be like, tell them that they, you know, did a good job if you don't want to do it like right now or whatever. And especially in the remote kind of context that we've been in for, you know, almost two years now. Um, I found that very helpful. Just, you know, really chunk up your time and follow up with people and uh, that kind of thing. Cause you know, our company works with sales stuff and I've seen how, um, like sales, uh, enablement kind of software. And I've seen how much like following up with people at the right time can actually like make and break businesses like completely. Um, so you should treat yourself like kind of the same way and be in front of the people when you need it, uh, when you need to be. Yeah. Anyone else have a skill that they want to share? I also use my calendar um, to keep myself organized. So I'm with you there, Sean. Yeah, I was going to say, that's probably the best one that even changes your life outside of work. Because like, I've never had such a clean calendar and email before. And I like started applying all the skills I learned at work um, on my everyday life there. So I definitely agree with that. Um, I was going to say one that I learned very in depth at work is probably like storytelling, uh, the ability to just like communicate your ideas, probably not just like even in presentation, but even how you talk about your ideas, which is pretty nuts. Cause um, at companies you kind of have to do it with people are, who are from completely different backgrounds. They're not designers. If you talk about how usable your thing is or how, you know, whatever, they're not going to understand that. Just knowing how to actually pitch it and uh, get buy-in from them, getting people psyched, which is like very difficult. But once you do, like not only will they get out of your way to let you build things you want to build, but they'll also like help push you towards whatever, whatever direction you want to go really. Um, and so that's helped a lot. I got so into storytelling. I actually started a YouTube channel where I make videos and stuff. And it's just like a fun thing that I really like doing now. Um, so yeah, it's like, I think another thing about it too, is like, especially in the field that where like things can be kind of overwhelming um, and intense, like with a lot of like obstacles and stuff like that, getting support from the people you work with, your stakeholders, collaborators and all that. It's like very much needed uh, and can just help you through your day to day. So yeah, I think that's a big part of what I love um, that I got out of working for these companies. Um, I'll go next. I'll, I, I love what your guys are sharing and I'm gonna follow up on that. So communication is definitely most, most important part of a UX designer's everyday work. 
And specifically, I found that using a um, whiteboarding tool like Miro or Miro or FigJam, it's very helpful to communicate with people with different backgrounds. Like some people have product backgrounds, some people are engineers, like they probably speak different languages, have different jargons with like a written document, like a PRD or something like that. It's usually like sometimes it doesn't work. But diagramming, it's always something that will bring everybody together. And I specifically want to highlight FigGem. So FigGem is something uh, the Figma team released to, you know, comp complement with the Figma tool itself. So I highly, highly recommend uh, everybody to try it out if you haven't tried it. Your, your company or your, your team or your, your class probably already using Miro or Miro. They're great, but they're also very clunky. Uh, there's a lot of features that is just like not helpful at all and it slow down your workflow. Um, FigGem is awesome for collaborating. Like if you want to communicate like very complicated user flow, or if you want to, you know, you have a new product and just want to align everybody on the same page on the progress or what's the goal for this quarter or something like that. It's, it's very helpful. And if you go through their library, there's a lot of um, template you can use or you can create your own template. So I've been using it for uh, what, start, uh, start from when it just released like a few months ago, I think it's really awesome. So try out. If you feel like you're talking to one of your teammate and you feel like, oh, like this, this person is not understanding what I'm talking about and we're having some issues on aligning things, go try out. Um, communication, again, it's the biggest, biggest, biggest part of the UX designer's life. Uh, or it doesn't matter, maybe like now I'm an engineer, I still need to talk to people every day on communicating my ideas and try to get everyone on the same page. So yeah, whiteboarding is your friend. And that's one of the reasons why in all the UX job interviews, we do whiteboarding. There's a reason behind it, which is this is one of the most important skills. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to echo <laughs> those points. Uh, communication is the key. Storytelling for sure. That was the biggest thing I learned from Accenture and Avanade, being in consultancy, talking to clients every day. How do you maintain a very healthy client relationship when they send you emails 4 a.m. in your morning? It's, it's not good. And you have to like manage their expectations. And everything could happen on your job. Uh, so be cool and also take care of yourself. I think because of COVID time, I, I just want to highlight this. Y you yourself is the most important asset in any workplace. It's not that, oh, this company is uh, so busy for me to work with or work for, and this team is like working crazy hours. But at the end of the day, you have to take care of yourself. Uh, the schedule is de determined by yourself. You can, you, and also learn to say no. I got tons of meetings in my calendar every day without me even noticing. They just sent like emails. We are on different mailing lists in the huge organization and they just sent emails to everyone. So they would reply to emails to everyone. So like getting through my emails could be one of the tasks every day I'll have to do. But I'm glad that Microsoft has its own tools to help with those things like, oh, Microsoft Viva, the new employee experience platform. I'm not trying to make a branding here, but I think those things really help people. Like they, those are digital tools and they help me to understand, oh, I got disrupted because of those meeting notice, because of those uh, emails that I got during my work hours, during my meetings. And they analyze and data visualization is key too. They analyze how I work. In, in, in the ways that I don't even notice myself. But uh, down to the bottom line, I think the most, I mean, the, the biggest thing other than communication is just saying no, taking care of myself. Like I'm not gonna always be there if you have a problem and I'm not gonna solve it tonight. I'm not trying to, let's get back to it tomorrow. The first thing in the morning, we can get this done, but not try to like overstress yourself because I think working from home is really making everything worse. There's no, like when back to back to back meetings seems to be a norm here and everyone can just put like meeting blocks on your calendar, but in the physical office space, we could still use some time to walk, to literally be late, but still have a reason because we might need to walk from point one to point B, point A to point B, but. In a, in, a, in a virtual world, it, it, it happens from a click. So 
say no to things you don't necessarily need to be involved in and uh, always protect your own time. This well-being is, is never gonna be out, 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 out of this topic because as I mentioned, that's the most important thing everyone should um, account for. Yeah, I, it's, it's interesting because everything that all of the panelists have said about these skills all boil down to essentially the same thing. It's the, the way that we use our time, the way that we make ourselves available, um, either to our team or to clients. Um, it's about figuring out how to balance that out in a healthy kind of way. And there's even like a, a friend of mine also has a hard time saying no, because there's the fear that if you say no, that means that the next opportunity is going to pass you by because you you turn it down that one time uh and there's like a linkedin course on like learn how to say no and i've actually sent people this link you know often to be like maybe you need to take this course just to kind of like learn how to do this and it is a skill right um so i think i think we can all sort of hear that in our own lives and and use that in our own lives no matter what industry we end up working in so thank you everybody for that really helpful insight um we have one question uh sitting in the q a and i see what time it is so um i just want to see if maybe anybody has uh an answer um we have somebody joining us from um they're they're uh, from japan they're currently li living in vancouver with a student visa so the question is, do you think it would be hard to find a company that would sponsor them for a visa as a UX UI designer, or do you have any tips for that? I'm not sure if anybody on the panel would have an answer. Oh, we've got some unmutes. Um, yeah, I think big companies are usually like really easy to get visas with because they have a huge budget and they don't care where you're from and stuff like that. I've seen small companies do it as well. So don't rule that out. But I would just say like apply everywhere. Like that would be like the way to go about it. Apply everywhere. And that would just kind of up your chances. You know, I think to be very honest, I think it's a numbers game. Like when I first came out of school, it's a numbers game with like, you know, job opportunities and stuff like that. I applied to 40 places, got heard back from two. And I've heard of people applying to like 200 places and hearing back from like five or something. So yeah, I would just do that, especially if you know there are some obstacles for you with visas and stuff like that. The more companies you apply to, you're going to raise your chances of having now, you know, those few that will help you sign up for a visa and all that and set it up for you. Um, and I'll add to that. So I was one, once an international student, so I know what the situation is. Um, I think I have two tips here, follow up, follow up on what Scott just mentioned. First of all, big companies are always easier in terms of visa, visa issues. Um, but also in terms to like in, in terms of getting into big companies, a lot of times you need connections. So if you're if you like if you are work, uh, a student from MB Car, we have a lot of alumni working at all these big companies. Go to LinkedIn, learn how to use LinkedIn, learn how to write a good message or note on LinkedIn so that it gets easier to connect to people. Um, reach out to other alumni, you know, all these people working at Google, Facebook, Amazon, whatever. Reach out to them and ask them, hey, um, can you help me to get, in, get an interview? Can you help me to use a referral or something? So network is key, so network, network, network. Especially in the UX field, it's very, very important that you have a connection to get an interview. Because these days, to be honest, sending in resumes online, usually you just never heard back because there are so many people that got referrals, they got ahead of you. Um, this is just the reality, so learn that. And in terms of your visa situation, be very specific on how you talk to recruiters. So big companies usually have recruiters to help them find uh, new grads. So when you communicate these people, be very specific on which visa you're on, what kind of sponsorship you need, what kind of situation you're in, because these recruiters, sometimes they're not that familiar with all these visa issues, you need to make sure they got the right message and they probably pass on to the right people like their, their lawyer team or, or something. So yeah, just like communicate well on all these and just like pray and, and, and just like, yeah, and just try. Yeah, and good luck on that, yeah. yeah I, was, I was laughing on that, on that front. And, and just one more note on that. Uh, yeah, it's in Vancouver, so always look for 
information that's coming from the federal government because they probably will launch different programs every year and also because of pandemic the labor shortage and everything in Canada is a real thing um so I'm not sure how the immigration policy will switch to the next chapter I I, I heard some news early this year uh and also probably every year is a different situation. It's a different story. And every province and territory is also different in terms of immigration uh, processes. I think the federal one is the most important thing you have to pay attention to. The policy changes uh, pretty much every year. <laughs> and uh, also get yourself an immigration lawyer for things like that. Don't get yourself into immigration fraud because that's also very hot, like one of the hot topics in, in, in the tech industry. Not every company will sponsor you. So like Tori said, always articulate your needs. Uh, big companies will definitely help you on things like that. That's for sure. I know Microsoft does that. They have a whole bunch of lawyer team helping things like that. Uh, but speaking of some other companies, they, there might be re restrictions in particular industries that's, our, uh, that's more related to, for example, like national security. Some of the areas that you're not supposed to be in. Um, if your future employers fit in that scope, probably you have to talk to a more uh, specialized or uh, a lawyer in, in this regard to help you solve this problem. Okay, well, I wanna thank all of the panelists so much for your time. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I'm sure we could keep chatting for another hour, but um, I am very grateful for the time you've offered us today and all the information you've shared, the insights you've shared. Um, so thank you to Sean B, Scott, Tori, and Sean D for your time today. Um, and thank you for everybody who joined us um, for this panel. I hope you join us for the next two, which are on Wednesday and Thursday, uh, for some more exciting information about the UX industry. Um, so thank you, everybody. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.